until you understand this, it's actually kind of hard to get money. But once you have this concept in your mind, it's really easy to get more than you need. And I have a couple of examples of how money isn't real, because every time I bring this up with people, um, the biggest response is, okay, boomer, <laughs> which I'm not. Um, for every boomer that doesn't like a millennial and every millennial that doesn't like a boomer, remember, there's a generation in the middle that hates you both. But there was a lot of my life where I thought money was real. I thought you worked for money. Um, think of a kid. The first time kid, your kid, or when you're a kid, and you experience the exchange of currency. You see somebody buy something. You see your parent back in the dinosaur days, pull out their wallet, pull out money, give money to the store to take the item. And as a kid, you think, I wish I had a wallet. If my wallet had money in it, I could buy things. And then later, you know, <laughs> not back in the dinosaur days, but somebody pulls out a credit card or a debit card. They don't even have to hold the currency. They don't even have to have that money that's that's dirty and gross and covered in germs. They pull out the credit card and they swipe it or now they tap it or now they put it on their Amazon account. So they don't even have to put it in more than once. The money isn't real. The kid sees, I wish I had a credit card. If I had a credit card, I could buy things. It's not even the money that I've had to work for. That's future money. I could borrow it now. So the kid doesn't wish that they could earn money or make money or even understand what money is. They wish they had a wallet because that would have money in it. Or they wish they had a credit card because then they could buy things. So it's not real. So as a parent, or an adult, when you see a kid go, I wish I had a wallet or I wish I had a credit card, the first thing we do is educate them. And most of us are poorly educated. That's why the, there's literally, it's not a 50% of us are rich and 50% are poor. We go 99%, 1%, right? The 1% are the people that everyone is either jealous of or hates or wants to become. But the 99% are the ones mostly educating our kids. There are some 1% teachers who invested right, put their money to work, but most are like the average parent, raising their kids, teaching their kids, how money works, you have to work for it. You can't just have a wallet that has money in it. You can't just have a credit card because you have to earn that money in the future. Worse, we tell kids you're going to need an education to make more money and you can get into all this free debt to get that education. This debt can not only pay for the school, but it can pay for your life while you're in training, creating more debt because it's not real. So we tell the kids, earn the money, work for it, um, save it. If you don't save it, you're going to retire broke. You're not going to ever be able to retire. You're going to be broke when you're old. You're going to become a burden to your kids. So it's first work for it. Now save it um, and spend it. If you, we use things like leverage on our kids. We say, uh, do you want the time on your iPad? Do you want an iPad? Do you want your gaming station? Do you want to play with your friends? Whatever that leverage is, that thing that kid wants, we say, in order to get that, we want you to get good grades. So as we get older, we go, you want, you want this thing, you want this nice truck, you want this bigger house, you want this nice vacation, you got to er earn the money to do it. So we've earned the money to spend the money. Why is it so easy to get into so much bad debt? Because we make the money not real. We go, cash is easier to have than physical gold. At some point, we decided gold was a currency because it took work to mine it out of the earth. Well, then we say, well, we have this, this thing called the dollar or whatever country you're from, the euro, the pound, the whatever. And we say there's so many dollars is worth so much gold, but it's easier to carry this paper currency. So you carry the paper currency. But even that has, is money that you've had to earn to have the money. So we go, how about you use your debit card? So the money sits in the bank. There's, there's trillions of dollars in currency on our planet, but less than 4% of it is actually in coin or paper, which means a large percentage of it is made up digital currency that's, that's again, money isn't real. Once you understand this, it becomes a lot easier to make more than you need. And someday I'm going to make a video where I only talk about the problem and I don't give you the solution, but not today. Today, I will give you the solution. We make it easy to get into bad debt. We go, here's a credit card. And you can put kids' names on your credit cards before they're old enough to even sign a 
a uh, contract so that they can get into good debt or bad debt. We can get them student loans, which can't be forgiven, and which have an adjustable rate. Like all of these things to give really bad debt, we make it easy. But having a credit card is too much work. It's still real. It's still plastic. It's still in your hand. So we make an app. We call it pay. So it sounds like you're earning something because you get a paycheck. Google Pay, Apple Pay, PayPal, all of these apps that make it easier to spend your money. Amazon has an app where you put your money in, you put your credit card information in once, you put your address in once, so that it's easier to spend this fake money, this money that's not real. You can just click a button, three things that make it real easy to get into bad debt. We make credit cards. We make, well, so first we make currency. Second, we make credit cards. So you can actually spend the money you haven't earned yet. Um, the not real money that you haven't earned yet. And then third, one click shopping and things like buy now, pay later, which often become uh, pay late, pay fees. So I'm going to give three examples of how money isn't real to see if one of them resonates with you the way it resonated with me to make it to where once you can understand that money's not real, it's actually really easy to make more than you need because associate this, um, these two things together. So sit back and answer yourself. Is it easy to get into bad debt? Sometimes you can get into bad debt without knowing it. Uh, 10 out of 10, don't recommend marriage. So three things, three ways that I think of money as not being real. The first is, is an example I take from a young lady named Soli, who was recently on uh, Christian and Cody's uh, multifamily strategies. She was like, and I'm probably going to butcher this because I have some memory issues. She was about 24, has 30 rentals. She invested in distance. She lives in a high cost of living area. And she was sharing her information with other people to get them to the point where they can understand that money's not real so that they can have more than they need as well. Remember, if it's easy to create more bad debt than you can support, it is just as easy to create more wealth than you can handle. They're the same because the money's just as fake. I'm going to ask you to think of about a month or two ago and think of an expense like fuel or milk. If you were going to fill your gas tank up and uh, I asked you two or three months ago, was fuel $2 a gallon? or $6 a gallon, you'd probably know. And then some people drive Teslas, so I can't do the fuel thing, but I could say, hey, two or three months ago, if you were buying milk and you bought a gallon of milk, was it $2 a gallon or $6 a gallon? Whether it was fuel or milk, the average person would have an answer. Like you would know the cost of that thing that you bought because we associate spending money with real money. You work most people and they earn a certain amount of money per hour. 10, 12, $15 an hour, $30 an hour, $100 an hour, it doesn't matter. You make a certain amount of money per hour. So we think if I'm going to buy milk and it's $5 a gallon or $6 a gallon and I make $20 a gallon, that's like a quarter of an hour. The way we see it before we think about it, because that's when you make the money and you have no expenses. Because first, now you're going to make the $20 an hour, but you have to pay taxes. You have to pay for where you live, um, everything that you eat, your transportation, your registration, your licensure, like all of these expenses to out of that $20, there's probably a couple of dollars left. So a $6 gallon of milk or a $6 gallon of fuel actually costs you three hours at work, right? That's disposable income, money that you're going to spend on something like this. So they were talking to Soli. And I just gave you an example of thinking two or three months ago, thinking of something where you spent two or six dollars on an item and you would know how much was the milk, how much was the fuel. They were talking to Soli, who is reaching financial freedom by investing in real estate the way that I, not the way that I did, but in the asset class that I invested in, right, rentals. And they were talking about a duplex that she bought two or three months ago when they did the interview. And, they, and she was just talking about it. And she says, yeah, we bought it two or three months ago. And I don't remember if, if it was 180000 or 190000 but it was somewhere in there. And, and then she went on with the rest of her story. In order to get to the point where, where work is optional and you are financially free, a $10,000 variance in your asset has to almost mean nothing compared to the person who's looking at the milk or the fuel and trying to figure out the best deal on it. 
So that's the first example. The second one is you can make money in real estate. This is not the way that I did it, but this is a way that can be done. With mine, I did a version of this over time. But if you buy an apartment complex, a, most residential real estate, the asset class that I invest in, the properties are, are valued based on the comps. So if I buy a fourplex, the appraisers are going to look at the fourplexes in the area or the small multifamily in the area to figure out how much it's worth based on how much they were sold for, how much people were willing to pay for them. But if you buy an apartment complex that has 10 or 20 or 30 units, the value of that property is based on the net operating income, the NOI. So if the rents coming in go up $50, $100 per unit, doesn't sound like too much, but if it goes up that much per unit and the expenses stay the same, you've increased the net operating income of the property, which increases the multiplier that the property's valuation is based on. You have created hundreds of thousands of dollars in value in the property that you own by improving, improve, words are hard, by improving the asset, stabilizing the asset, increasing rents, increasing your net operating income. So understanding that with assets, the numbers become theoretical and that with some asset classes, their values being based on net operating income or use that same strategy with the burr. You take a property that needs repairs and doesn't have a lot of value because of the work that it needs. It's probably not inhabitable. You buy it, you make it habitable, you make it lendable, you refinance the money, you actually take money out and then have a cash flowing asset. You are creating this fake money. And the third way, the one that's more a little more tangible is, is uh, and I'm going to steal this from Robert Kiyosaki because he talks about it often. He was actually alive and doing transactions when these things happened. Um, but it, I talked at the beginning of the video that we used to back money with gold. We said it takes so much time and energy to get the gold out of the ground, to refine the gold, to make it in transportable fashion. And, and then we've decided that had value. So we said there's so much gold to the dollar. The, the American currency had the, the 20 dollar gold coin and there was so much gold that was supposed to be worth twenty dollars it was it was an equivalent well in 1971 we changed from a gold backed currency to a fiat currency fiat fugazi fake blend them all together and you come up with the currency that we have now where it's not backed by anything like i said trillions of dollars in currency moving around the planet from all the different countries less than four percent of that is actually in coin or currency so most of this is now even digital let alone just the paper that we printed and to make people trust it, we had to actually put the words in God we trust on the paper so people would think it was backed by something. It's not real. And remember, I said, it's just as easy to create bad debt as it is to create great wealth. More debt than you want, more wealth than you can handle. Why is it so easy to get into debt? Right? Why, why is it so easy to get a credit card? Everyone just says, put a certain amount of money into a bank account and get a card that matches that amount of money until you build a credit. And now you can borrow more money. You can get your credit increased and you can earn, you get a good credit score to borrow money, usually for the wrong things like a bigger car or student loan debt or credit card debt, which so student loan debt's even worse than credit card debt. Student loan debt, adjustable rate, can't be bankrupt, uh, used, you know, getting rid of the bankruptcy. Um, credit card debt has an adjustable rate but we make it easy. We have counselors who teach 16 year olds how to prepare for college so you can create college debt to go to college. We have tables set up at colleges where people go, here's how you sign up for a free credit card. We make it easy. We have apps that you can put on your phone. We have in-app purchases where a couple of years ago, people had to do massive reimbursements because we made it too easy for kids to do in-app purchases. So there, there was some, not common, but common sense used to, to reimburse some of those fees. But the three things that make it real easy to go into bad debt, we made currency, we made debt like credit cards. Now we have apps, we have buy now, pay later. All of these ways to get into bad debt, you need to take that association with making money not real. There are some people who say, well, I only carry cash so that I can feel it leaving my hands, making it more real to them, even though it's a fiat currency, which limits them from being able to buy on websites, limits them from being able to use apps, right? So, so if you want to limit yourself and restrict yourself in spending, using cash is one way to help reduce your spending. Um, the other way is people using credit and debt and apps makes it easier, right? 
what you need to do, I wouldn't do this without giving you a solution, is make it easy to build wealth. Debt is easy to create because we remove friction. I don't have to carry currency. I have credit cards. I don't even have to have a credit card. I could tap my phone. We make it easy. It's automated. Less friction. Take those same words and apply it to wealth. Make it automated. Remove the friction. The concept of pay yourself first. Uh, a lot of retirement accounts end up being some people's biggest investment because they don't invest in anything because it takes action, but they automate the retirement account and it comes out before you get your paycheck. That's why taxes are usually taken out before you get your paycheck too. Set up an auto payment into an investment account that comes out before you see it so that there's money that is automated going into an investment account, not an account that's invested. Like I'm not talking about a well-diversified stock portfolio. I mean, an account that you will use for investing. That money could be used for a stock investing account. It could be used to start and grow a business. It could be used to buy and invest in real estate. And then depending on your level of lazy and what excites you, study your asset class and master it. If it's stocks, are you a gambler? Do you want to do day trading? Will you educate yourself on the stock system so well that you can outperform an index fund that's diversified across hundreds of different companies? Or if you're a little more lazy, maybe not so lucky or don't have the mental bandwidth for it, you invest in that diversified stock portfolio, something like the S&P, or maybe you would invest in dividend stocks. You take that money, you can start and grow a business. Understand your assets mentally. What can you produce in, as a business that you would do well at? Uh, most of my family are entrepreneurs. My father and my two brothers, two of my brothers, owned tree services, residential tree services. Uh, I am not an entrepreneur. I don't have an entrepreneurial bone in my body. I, uh, I'm a good employee. I've always had no trouble finding a job, keeping a job, excelling at a job, but I'm definitely not an entrepreneur. So I'm an investor. I chose something that lined up with my lazy. Save a down payment. Buy a rental property. Of the rental properties that I have, I've house hacked twice. So I've had to move twice. But I went from a really bad position. And in less than, well, about eight years, so less than 10 years, I made work optional. I worked for four more years because I really liked my job. But after investing for 12 years, realizing that money's not real made it easy for me to have more money coming in from sources outside of my job. So I no longer have to sell my life one hour at a time to make money. And I'm trying to get as many of you to do something like that. It won't look exactly like mine. I suggest that you do things like watch one rental at a time, watch the lumberjack landlord, watch millennial Mike, watch Christian and Cody, small multifamily, take in the information from a bunch of different investors who've done it several different ways. Most of our strategies actually look very different, but take some element from each one of us to find the strategy that will work for you. Take the fake money. Put the fake money to work to make more fake money. You are going to be alive in five years. Start investing like it. Because believe me, in five years, you'd rather have a lot of fake money than a lot of fake debt. And most people are just working on the debt. So that will eventually be a video on its own. I haven't quite figured out how to do that yet, but I will. Howdy, everybody. How's everybody doing? Let me uh, get to the hellos here and hopefully get through the questions. Tonight's live stream will have to be about an hour and a half long. I've got the Tacoma FI meetup tonight at 6 o'clock. So I'm going to set an alarm here so I'm not late. Um, so if you're in or around the Tacoma area, we, there's a Facebook group, Tacoma FI. We are meeting tonight. Uh, we meet once a month on the second Tuesday, which I believe that's today. Um, my memory is not great, but I hope it is today. Let me look through the hellos here. First thing is Amafit. Howdy. Just tapped my phone. Thank you for the super chat. It's easy to spend money because it's not real. <laughs> Thank you, Amafit, for that. That's awesome. Um, Dividend Dave. Howdy. Keeping West Coast landlord friendly for me? Um, no. 
No, the the landlord friendly stuff seems to shrink and the tenant friendly seems to grow pretty much everywhere over time. All nighter hider, howdy. Angelina, howdy. Uh, All nighter hider, hit that like and encourage Dion to make it rain with what isn't real. That is exactly it. So I'm going to be making a video for this Thursday. Uh, I've had several people reach out and ask me um, for an hour. You know, phone call. I don't want to call it a consultation because uh, I'm not a fiduciary. I don't have run a business for giving financial advice, right? I'm just sharing what how I reach financial freedom to see if other people can do the same thing and maybe help you get there. But a lot of people have said, how much would you charge for an hour? And uh, the numbers have been all over the place. I've heard 150 an hour, 200 an hour, 300 an hour. Uh, Zuber's got a course where you could take it for currently $320. Uh, it's going to $399 by the end of the year. So if you're looking at the one rental at a time, how to get started course, uh, that price is about to go up. Um, but you could pay another, I think it's around $300. So it's like six something to get uh, time with Zuber, like a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with Zuber. So he charges a certain amount per hour. I have decided how much. I finally decided how much it's going to be per hour. I'm going to share it in that video. Um, and I think I'm going to title it, I'm a hooker. Michelle, howdy. Eldon, <laughs> howdy. Financial fighter, aloha. You took a message back to make me lose sleep and wonder forever and ever what was there. And now I will never know. Very sad. Tiara, howdy. Aloha from Hawaii. To and fro global, howdy. That reminds me of the Flat Earth Society. We have supporters all around the globe. Chester, howdy, Chester. Levi, howdy. Todd, howdy, all nighter. Just shared the live on Facebook. Nice. Thank you. Hopefully some people get tricked into coming here. <laughs> Mike, howdy. Laura, howdy. Lim, howdy all. Gavin, those, howdy. Those who refuse to learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Exactly. Uh, especially when it comes to money. We all have such short memories. We forget things are cyclical and we think things will go a certain way forever. Uh, home values can only go up. Uh, inflation can only go up. Lauren, howdy from Tacoma. You're on the clock, so we'll stay as long as I can tonight. Hopefully it's a very boring night. Sorry you can't make it to the Tacoma FI. You let me know that last time. So we'll... Maybe we'll pick a different day of the week for one in the future to see what works. We picked Tuesdays. It worked for most people, but I think we've talked about setting up a weekend one. Dylan, howdy. Stop my study session to be here. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what are you studying and what's the desired outcome? I'm curious. REI Stoners, howdy. It's been a long day, so I may fall asleep to Dion's soothing voice. Nice. Exactly. That's what my voice does. Puts people to sleep. Makes dating awkward. John, howdy. I finally got to catch you live. Yes, you did. Um, uh, so this would be a great time, John, to put in a question you would like answered live. Gano, howdy, from Oklahoma. Nice. Gavin, taking, <laughs> working remote during the live. Nice, exactly. Good plan. <laughs> All nighter hider. You're really going to blow minds and get into the euro dollar system? No, <laughs> the US dollar based foreign currency system. That's way bigger than our domestic dollar system. Yeah, no, I could barely understand our dollar system, uh, let alone getting into something like the euro. Uh, or the pound or literally how anything works anywhere. All I've, all, all I've experienced with foreign currency is choosing. There's two criteria that I like to choose a country when I travel. First is it's really hard to find countries that still like Americans. And second, a place where the, the currency exchange is highly favored to the dollar. So I've been to Colombia. And I've been to Thailand, where it is thousands of the um, peso or the bot to the dollar, making uh, it very easy to take a vacation, do all of the things you want to do, and then come home with more money than you left with. Adam, howdy. How do you like Thatch's method of accumulation phase and then payoff phase? Accumulate the properties you need, then pay them off. So... I'm actually doing a microscopic version of his macroscopic reality. He got to a large point, paid off a bunch, then bought more and paid off a bunch, then bought more and paid off a bunch, and has grown a massive portfolio. Lots of respect for him. I grew the portfolio until I hit the 4X rule. 
the idea being there's four times the amount of cash flow that I need f- to live my life. So your freedom number, a lot of people understand in the financial freedom retire early community is a freedom number is the amount of money that it takes you to live every month. If you have that much money coming in from assets that you don't have to sell your life for one hour at a time, you've reached financial freedom. For me, once I hit the four actual, so there was four times my freedom number coming in every month that I don't have to work for, then it actually felt kind of silly to continue working. If I was going to follow Thatch's system, it would be pay off some debt and then acquire a bunch more properties and then pay off some debt and then acquire a bunch more properties. And I'm only going to do that that iteration once. I acquired the properties to hit the 4X rule. I'm slowly deciding, do I pay off debt to increase cash flow as a property is paid off? Um, or do I slowly add properties? I'm not in the pay off debt to add a whole bunch more properties because I'm actually not trying to create another job. Self-managing my 16 rentals uh, takes me on average less than two hours a month. I've had a couple of months where it was four or five hours, and I've had three or four months in a row where I don't even have a text from a tenant. So it probably takes me 30 minutes those months to just check and make sure rents are paid. And so that was my goal with real estate, this time freedom. But the money keeps piling up. So do I pay off debt or do I add rentals? I'm not motivated to do either quickly. But I think that's just plan is like Zuber, uh, Millennial Mike, Lumberjack Landlord, they're all on, on trajectories to, you know, two of them have massive portfolios. Millennial Mike will have a massive portfolio. He's, on, he's set to scale faster than I did and, uh, and that my goals were to do. So if somebody's wanting to do that, I think you could take elements from each one of us and apply them to a system that works that way. Um, but it's not my goal. So that doesn't mean I don't agree with it or don't think it's a great system. It's just not the system for me. All Nighter Hider, I hope Dion reads that aloud. Almost this close. <laughs> Consider the logic. Here for another like and comment. I appreciate it. Thank you. And welcome, John. Fiat is by decry, meaning do it or else. <laughs> that is actually accurate. Uh, a lot of people don't remember, and I don't remember because it was before I was old enough to have a memory, but it was illegal in the United States to own gold. We had to eliminate, reduce the use of gold to make sure that the dollar held its value when we first went off the gold standard. And then we have consumerism from a name in numbers. Howdy. Howdy, Rob. You're here. Ta-da. Thanks for making it. Rob is here. We can start now. I agree. Claude. Howdy. Every young adult needs to hear your message. Love you, man. Thank you. I, I would I would hope so. Um, I don't know that I'm articulate enough to make it resonate with younger people. I'm more aligned, I think, with people who are at that point where you finally wake up one day. It's almost like we all have the same path. We become adults. We either start a family or start a career or start both. And then we we rack up a bunch of bad debt. And at some point, for some people, it's when you're 22. For some people, it's when you're 30. For me, I made it to, to 40 without ever having $1,000 in the bank. And it was like, I woke up and I thought, Maybe I'm supposed to take charge of my finances and actually do something productive with money. Um, that's who I'm talking to. The people who are like have that that awakeness moment. Um, Bruno, howdy. Made you sit alive. Financial freedom. Here we come. Exactly. Let's get you there. Nice. I like the image at the end with the snowball. Adam, what's your average yield in Tacoma? Great deal. So for several years, it wasn't too hard to find six to eight percent returns. And the way I run the math on that, as I've explained in a few videos, is out of a hundred properties that I look at, eighty are terrible and would never make any money. Like most, and especially almost well, hundred percent of single-family homes that I've seen in this area just wouldn't make money as a as an investment. So the small multifamily that I've looked at, eighty percent are terrible. Like the sellers are just drunk on how much they think they'll get. And they might get it because there are people who are redeploying 1031 exchanges or just looking for a place to store money, not caring about cash flow, especially foreign investors where their currency can tank faster than ours in their mind. So they invest here to keep it safe. Like there's all kinds of reasons we'll never understand why somebody buys a deal that we saw as a negative cash flow. Um, so they still sell. So I get the sellers wanting to get as much money as possible. It's actually their goal and it's their agent's job to make sure they get the best deal. Uh, so I was finding six to eights 
And so for the last decade, I've hunted for tens. So out of the 20 that do make sense, most would get six to 8%. Uh, some with, uh, well, almost all across the board would need to use the binder strategy. So I would get rents to just below area average. So not looking at the rents the way they are. Um, one or twice there was value add. I saw I was buying a property that had two bedrooms, one bath each side of the duplex and a den, which meant I had three bedrooms and a bathroom each side. I just hadn't had a wall built yet. So I was buying for that kind of value add. But all my deals so far, I've gotten a little bit better than 10%. First, um, and I call them base hits. I have one home run that was a 17% cash on cash return. I have a friend who purchased that. I got a better deal than all of mine. Um, she purchased November of last year. Um, much better yield. But that doesn't mean that I'm only going to buy properties that get a 10% cash on cash return going forward. If all of a sudden I started seeing more properties get me a 10%, I'd start looking for 12s. If I can't find anything that's getting a six or eight and I start finding fours or sixes, I might look for an eight. Um, and so much of our, so much of us get really hung up on what is my yield? It's got it's got to make this cal yield calculation, not thinking. And, and there are times where an investor who's been investing for decades will say, I have this huge portfolio. It produces a bunch of cash flow. I'm only going to buy great deals. Like it's got to be the slam dunk, home run, goal, whatever sports ball analogy I probably don't understand of it being the best deal ever, or they're not going to do it. I don't see that. I think it's consistently getting base hits because without base hits, you don't get RBIs that got me to the point where I had enough home runs over time. You know, most of my properties cash flowed somewhere between four to $550 per unit when I purchased them. Almost across the board, all, well, all of them right now are over $900 a unit. Um, some of them are over a thousand. And then there's one, one paid off property that kind of skews the numbers to make it seem like there's got a lot more cash flow than, than there is on like an average. Um, but that's because base hit rental owned over time. Time in the market beats timing the market. And every time I've owned a rental for, I think three years is probably the minimum that it's taken to get over a 20% cash on cash return. Um, I probably have a terrible cash on equity return. Like if I sold my portfolio, take that amount of money and redeploy it for even a 10% return, I'd be making more money, right? But I'm lazy. And there is something to be said about having a dialed in tenant where you have a rental that you deal with very minimally and you just have maintenance and repairs that over time the tenant's going to pay for because part of that income is being set aside into the repairs fund. Uh, so the tenants are going to fix things in the future. I hope that helped. So it kind of depends on your area and don't get home run itis. All Nighter Hider. Mike Dillard breaks down the wealthy mindset to train one's brain to get dopamine hit from deferred gratification at the subconscious level. Right. It's it's like opening up an app and looking for how many likes you have on a on a post. Or there are people who buy scratch tickets, which the lottery is a tax on the poor, right? right? And, they, and they scratch the lottery tickets for that dopamine hit. Yes, you might. And I have a friend who recently... <laughs> He turned in his notice at his job and then was fired the next day. And then the next day, won $50,000 on a scratch ticket. So it happens. There are people who can win money in the lottery, right? But they don't really do it for the win. They do it for the daydream. You know, what would happen if I won? And then every time they scratch, this is a dopamine hit of I could win. If they win two or four dollars, they won something. So they repeat it. Like they they know how to make the imagery um, and the and the confusing system of how the odds work to make you want to buy more. For me. I turned my emails into that. Every time I open up an email from one of my auto searches from a, one of the realtors I've worked with that have set up auto searches for me, that's my lottery scratch ticket. That's my dopamine hit. I open that email. This might be the next place that gets me another thousand dollars a unit in cash flow. And then. See, we have another super chat, which I appreciate because that tells YouTube to, hey, share this to some people. We're all, almost at 100 people online at the same time now. We're at like 90 something. Um, we have 36 likes. I appreciate that. It's a one third ratio. That's pretty good. Um, and you have a super chat here from James J. Glad to be catching this stream for my 10 hour work day. Yes. Let's get you to where that's optional. I'm not telling you to quit your job, James. I'm telling you to get to a point where you're working because you want to and not because you have to. Everybody think about that. What kind of world would we live in if people could do the jobs they wanted to because they wanted to 
and not because they had to for the money. Thanks, James. Scooby Two, howdy. Currently house hacking and saving for my second, but I'll take I'll take about one year. It's tough to stay patient, but your videos take talking about the feeling of being financially free is helping. I hope the videos about being financially free help because. I think I actually lack the ability to put into words what financial freedom gets you and, and how <laughs> while I worked four more years because I love my job, I, I'm looking back at those last four years thinking, wow, four of those years could have been like this year. Holy crap, what was I doing? Um, but I hope the videos that help you the most are the ones where I talk about the first five years being the hardest. It seems slow. It's, it's saving for a, a one year for a, a rental. That, that to me is a huge accomplishment. Um, and for good job not thinking if I can't buy one for a year, what are all the creative, more risky, more detailed strategies that I can use to buy a property now sooner? Because I have to do it now. Increasing the risk, increasing the chance of failure, um, increasing the stress level, increasing the workload. I invested very passively. It took me over a little over two years to get the first duplex, two years to get the second duplex. So I was four years in, I'd done two things. And then about a year and a half, then, then paid off a property and then about a year. So it like starts to speed up and get easier and easier but those first five years felt like yeah this might happen eventually yeah there's a lot to learn um getting the dopamine hits from the auto searches from the emails helped talking with other investors helped i like the the one rental at a time rule of audit your network get around people who are actually doing these kind of things local rei meetups i'm not saying eliminate your friends but maybe you have some friends or family that you just don't talk finances with for a reason um my brother has 10 paid off rentals, retired at 50, financially free. When I got my first rental, he called me an idiot. Well, he called me a moron. It's our family, familial term of endearment, uh, moron, because I had a mortgage. And he couldn't understand for the life of him, why would we have a mortgage? Why would you ever buy a rental with a mortgage? He never did. He used the whole equity line of credit to buy one and then pay it off as quick as possible. And I'm, I'm committing to 30 years of owning a mortgage. And I'm thinking, yeah. David, I would like to have a thousand year mortgage because I don't care about the debt. I don't care about having paid off properties. I care about the cash flow. Um, audit your network and know who you can and can't talk money with. Scooby 2, what did you do during those early savings years that made it easier to stay patient? Um, there was a huge mental shift as soon as I realized that it was possible. So I was living in my house with my kids and a lender told me there's no way that you can borrow money to buy a rental. Um, and luckily I was listening. Uh, he, he said, because, you know, you don't have any rental income on your tax returns. If you had rental income on your tax returns for two years or more, then we'd be able to factor that into your purchase. Cause I wasn't making a lot and I had a lot of bad debts. So I had a bad debt to income ratio and a low income. So I was really limited. So I was like, wait, that's all I have to do get rental income on my tax return. So I moved out of my house into an apartment. Um, I also eliminated a bit of a commute, got my kids into a new school. My daughter was excited about being, one of my daughters was excited to be, about being the new girl. Um, so there was a couple of birds killed with the same stone. But those two years, when I saw in just two years, I'll have rental income on my tax returns. I'll be able to buy a rental, like a, a small multifamily, where they're going to use the rent from the other units in my debt to income ratio without me having to get a better job, better paying job, it would tackle the eliminate the debt, like literally change the whole game. I sat back and it gave me this superpower version of confidence. Um, I was in the Marines. I was a truck driver. I was a police officer. My family ate because I worked. Like I was literally at the beginning of this video. I talked about money not being real. There was a period where I thought it was real. I thought I had to sell my life one hour at a time to get the money to pay for things. And all of a sudden I saw, if I can do this, and it was at the beginning, I thought it was just every two years before I had realized the income snowball was a thing. And about the five to six year mark, things speed up really fast. Um, I thought in, in 10 years, I'll have five rentals. If I'm house hacking, living for free, and each rental's kicking off this much cash flow, I'll never have to work again. Right. And, and I thought I would. I liked my job. Like I said, um, I didn't reach financial freedom yet. I hadn't even purchased the first re rental yet. And the company I was working at, the owner retired and new owners purchased it. And these new owners, 
uh, knew nothing about transportation. I was I was working at a truck driving school teaching people how to drive trucks. Their goal was very altruistic. They wanted to help people get a new career and they wanted to grow a school and run it with honor, right? That's the, um, the, the it was like a husband and wife team and the husband was raised, he was said formative years in England and he had this strong sense of morals, right? And he wanted the school to run more professional because there are a lot of CDL schools out there that are not run very professionally. And, and they came in to own the company if I didn't have the mental idea, this is how financial freedom will work. This is my timeline. This is how I'm going to buy the rentals. And like work is going to be completely optional. I wasn't even started yet, right? I was just living in the apartment, renting out the house. I had an idea that would grow the school. If I thought I needed the job, if I knew I had to sell my life to feed my kids and that the job was that important, I would have just kept my mouth shut. I would have kept my head down and just done my job. But since I knew I don't need this job, actually, I don't need any job. As long as I can go out and make a little bit more than minimum wage, I can buy a rental every two years because my rental income on my tax returns is going to be what gets me the rentals, not my salary, not my debt to income ratio, not to anything like that, that normally matters to people. I took my idea to the owners and I was like, here's my idea. This is, this is, this is how you grow this company. Um, and they gave me the coolest chance ever. They said, look, Sounds like a great idea, but we don't know anything about transportation. We're, not, we're just here to grow the school. So we're going to try your idea for six months. And if it works, you'll run the place. If it doesn't work, you're fired and someone else will run the place. And I was like, awesome. Because one, I don't need this job. And two, I actually thought my idea would work. And then it did. So then I became the president of the company. I grew the company from six staff with one location to 60 staff and five locations. And then I had the best day ever in July of this year. And I sat back and I thought that was an amazing, it was the best day I'm ever going to have at this job. I quit. Go out at the top of your game. Some people do what Zuber did from one rental at a time. They have a really bad day. They tell their boss they don't want to do something. The boss says, you're going to do something. And he says, I quit. <laughs> 45 minutes after walking into work, he goes home and wasn't planning on it. I really wasn't planning on retiring until I did a couple of videos in the, in the last few months before I retired. So I retired in July. So in you know in uh, May, June, I did a couple of videos on. Let me explain my cash flow. This is how much I'm making from my rentals, and I really I whiteboard broke down. If I worked forty hours a week, this is how much I'm making an hour. It was like eighty something dollars an hour, um, and this is if it was twenty four hours a day. Since I'm getting paid whether I'm awake or asleep, it was like nineteen dollars an hour. And I sat back and I was looking at that, and I was like. First of all, that's six figures a year without having to get out of bed. Why am I working? And then a month later or so, had that great day. And it was actually, it was a lot easier to walk away from a job I liked than I thought it would be. Um, people who say money can't bring you happiness. Money brings you options. Options bring you happiness. Joseph, howdy. Make sure I didn't miss anything here. What's up? I'm glad I could catch you live too. Me too. I'm glad you could catch it too. Todd, howdy. I'm in the process of building a fourplex. Cool. Two bedroom, two bath, three bedroom. Oh, it's a two or two bedroom, two or three bath, all 2.5 bath. Sorry, side by side. Love it. I could prefer living room, kitchen, downstairs, bedroom, upstairs. My problem is I can't decide on floor plan. Uh, floor plan municipality approval permits like all that stuff so you're going to be going through ideas on what to appeal to the most people as possible if you could design the best apartment from scratch how would you lay out the living room kitchen main floor through thoughts on bedroom layout so i think you're hitting most of the key elements you have side by side so you don't have tenants living above or below another you have more than one bathroom per unit to me that's as important as bedroom count because at some point I would pick a way to lay it out to where each bedroom almost looked like it had its own bathroom so that if you decide, because who knows what you're going to do in five or 15 years, student by the room, traveling nurse by the room, short-term rental by the room, like there's all these options where I'm not doing any of that. All of mine are long-term. I want year-long or longer leases and they rent the entire unit. So why have a roommate situation in two places where there's, there's roommates living in there, but they all sign one lease commitment with all their names on the lease. Um, you're hitting most of them all washer dryer hookups in each unit. I wouldn't do a shared laundry because that's just people waiting for a place to open up that has washer dryer in the unit. So I'd make sure that you do that. Parking is as important as everything else. Know your area. Here in Washington, you can actually get more rent from having a carport than having a garage. 
And, and there might be some really hot climates where that might be the same or, or the opposite. So know your local area to, as, to, as to what rents better. Um, what does parking look like on your fourplex location? Um, I'm trying to think of anything else that would come to me because I haven't done a build. I'm actually the really lazy investor. I haven't done a rehab. Closest I've come is doing like flooring and paint. Um, I've helped a friend do a rehab a couple of times, a couple of different friends, but uh, that's not my type of investing. I prefer to buy already occupied or rent ready properties. Um, building is, is a huge thing, but then you have exactly what you're looking for, you know, side-by-side -side units uh, with you're putting the thought into the layout. I mean, you're hitting everything that I would think that I would look for. Dividend day. Landlords still rule in North Carolina. For now. At least this one does. Nice. Especially when you're house hacking. A lot of places, even like in Oregon, there are, are some strict tenant-friendly rules, right, which aren't friendly to the tenant, but they're tenant-friendly rules like um, rent control, which forces the landlord to raise the rent the maximum amount allowable every year. In other words, they quickly fall behind and can never catch up. Um, but if you're house hacking, or if you have a, less than a certain number of units, or if it's owner occupied in some way, like there's all kinds of ways where you might not get hit by those tenant friendly regulations. So it really pays to know your local regulations. Brock, howdy. Good evening. Is there an app for Hemlane for your tenants to pay through? There's a website, like a portal, so they can pay there. I don't know if there's an app I'll have to check. Um, and, and so with Hemlane, I'm not, I didn't go through my entire portfolio and say, okay, everybody now on Hemlane and this is how you have to pay. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have one tenant who pays in cash and it's always covered in glitter. And I, have, I haven't asked him why it comes that way. Uh, and I have another tenant who literally writes the year's worth of checks and gives it to me. So I'm not going to take someone like that and say, here's the website you have to go to. The one has a flip phone and no internet connection at their house. Um, like, I'm not going to change the existing tenants, but as I rotate in the new tenants, as I listed those properties through Hemlane the, the, earlier this year, those tenants will be on the platform currently just doing through the website. I actually didn't check to see if they have an app. So great question. Matthew Paris. Howdy. Redfish fun. Howdy. There's a podcast, something like Redfish Bluefish. Have you had a rental that you bought and had to drop the rent so it wasn't cash flowing? And if it did, what would you do to fix it? So I've never bought a rental and had to drop the rent. I've never seen rents go down. Um, I did pass on a rental because the cash flow looked great. And I mean, it was it was at or a little bit above area average rents. And I thought that's, that's a good, it was when I was first starting to invest, it looked great. And while talking to the tenant on the walkthrough, I found out that that tenant didn't pay a deposit and that their deposit was spread out over the first year, increasing the amount of rent that they're paid, paying. So they expected their rent to go down at the end of that lease. And none of this was in the lease. It was just, it was a verbal commitment between them to where the lease just said they rent them out with no deposit and didn't talk about renewal. So they had agreed to that beforehand. I wouldn't have known that if I didn't talk to the tenant during the inspection. So that would have been a time where rent rents would have gone down. So I've never purchased a property that would have negatively cash flowed. Um, I have purchased properties that would have barely made any money at current rents. And then the binder strategy gets the rents up to where I get the yield that I'm looking for within a few months. Um, so what would I do to fix it? I would not use current rents. Like I said, even in my example where the lease and the rents being paid weren't the rents the tenant was expecting to continue to pay. Uh, I would use area average rents and go about 10% below that. And if it didn't yield at that amount in that area, I wouldn't purchase the property. If I purchased a property and I had this happen one time, uh, previous owner really liked the tenants. So at point of purchase, they did a new one-year lease. And that one-year lease was significantly lower than where the binder would have gotten them and, and what area average rents were. So that one property didn't, it wasn't negative. I didn't lose money, but it didn't cash flow where I would want it to for that year. So what how I did, how I calculated that this was still a, a property worth pursuing is the other side did cash flow, this side cash flowed some. But I took the month, about $300 a month that I would not be getting that I would have liked to have got. The binder strategy took both sides from like 11 25 and 11.30 to 14.60 when it was used eventually. But the one was stuck at 11.30 for a year. So 300 bucks a month, basically. 
That's $3,600. I took the $3,600 and I calculated it into the, calculated it, words are hard, into the cost to acquire. If it cost me $3,600 more to purchase this property, my yield was still good enough. So I still pursued it. Um, ways to get rents up. If you haven't watched it, uh, Redfish, uh, check out on this channel. It's called The Binder Strategy. There's like a 20-minute video where I talk in detail on how my tenants ask me to raise the rent for them. Like they come to me and they say, will you please raise our rent three or $400 um, a month and then say thanks when it happens and generally stay and have happy tenants. And, and over 10 years, I've only had four tenant turnovers total. Two of them happened this year. Um, the second thing is, so first is binder strategy to raise the rent. Second thing is there's times when tenant turnover is a good thing. You might not want to renew with tenants. You might have a such a big gap that you're going to get a better return than even having a tenant. A tenant might ask you for a three or $400 rent increase, but if they move out, you might get a $1,200 a month rent increase. And there can be times where the, the variance is that different to where tenant turnover is a good thing. So understand what your local rules are. And if you're allowed to not renew a lease, um, that that's one option. Um, Others are, do your rentals have storage? Would adding a shed impact the rents? If you buy a place like I talked about, my duplex that had two bedrooms and a den, they really had three bedrooms each side, but I just had to add the one wall and a door and a light switch. Because you know, the closet was already there, source of heat was already there, one way in and out was already there. So, right. Uh, can you value add to increase the rent by changing the number of bedrooms or number of bathrooms in a unit? That's generally the biggest exchange, change in rents is, is, is number of bedrooms versus anything else that you can add. Like putting in a hot tub isn't going to change your rents. Sometimes even adding a garage isn't going to change your rents very much. There you go. Rob, Dion, what is the gain value of Zuber's Facebook group? So to be in the Facebook group, you have to be, you have to have taken one of One Rental at a Time's courses that gets you into the Facebook group. The Facebook group is only people who've taken the course. And generally, from what I've seen, only people who are taking action, buying deals, asking questions like this when somebody says, hey, here's the property I'm looking at offering. They, they ask uh, the questions I would ask. You know, have you studied the market? What is average in the market? How does that compare to average? How many economic drivers are there in the area? What type of tenants are you going to be placing in there? Uh, do you diversify your tenants? Like all the, the conversations are uh, like that. So that that's my benefit is if you've taken the course, you should definitely be in the Facebook group. Even if there are a couple of people in that Facebook group that are like, I don't have Facebook. I don't ever use Facebook, but they made a, an account for that group. Um, and it's not very sales pitchy. There's there's nobody nobody's allowed to go in there and post uh, you can use our brokerage, use our lender, whatever, or anything like that. And it's um, not all, but most of the millionaires that present on one rental at a time. So Millennial Mike, um, Anna Kelly, Lumberjack, uh, Beth Traverso, like the, the people who are doing these things are actually in those groups. Most of us are pretty active on social media. So if you want to be in one group where we all interact and feel free to interact, because like I'm, in, I'm, I'm a social uh, media nerd, right? I'm in a lot of... Uh, financial groups, a lot of real estate groups. And in most of them, I don't talk. I actually got kicked out of the Burr group. Um, Nate, Nate, somebody put the group together because I have a video that says how to Burr and why I don't. And they make all of their money off of tricking, in my opinion, people into saying Burr is the only way to make money in real estate. And Burr was great for the last 10 years, but how's that working out now? And anybody who's spouting a warning of here's the ways that a new investor can mess up, I literally got kicked out of the group. Choose FI, <clears throat> great community, talks about frugality, putting money to work, all the different paths to financial freedom. But if you talk real estate, <laughs> you don't get kicked out. Like their admins are pretty cool, but you get pounced on by the, the few people who used to own a rental or the people who have heard the nightmare stories of somebody who used to own a rental. So the one rental at a time Facebook group is a, and I don't want to use this term because it, it's it's way more woke than I would consider myself, but it's a safe place. If you said something in there about real estate and you were wrong, like literally off, you calculated it wrong, used the wrong term. I haven't seen anybody pounce on anybody. They'll just go, you know, kind of kind of the nerdy thing and push the glass up. Actually, here's what that means, right? You, you kind of get that support. That's what I think the, the value is from that Facebook group. Bruno, howdy, and thank you for being a member. I need to do a member's video this Friday. So that reminds me how to do that. 
I'll put the link up probably tomorrow on what that will be about. My question is, should I wait until I file my 2022 taxes to apply for a loan to get a bigger amount as I made much more money in 2021, 22 than in 2020? So they're going to lend against the asset. Is the asset value going to change? Is your income from 2020 or sooner, 2021 or sooner, limiting your ability to borrow on that asset? Is it going to open up more funds there? But anytime you're talking about getting a bigger loan, the first question, because part of the question that comes up later is, should you use a home equity line of credit? Can you pay it off quickly? Can you handle the adjustable rate? Is your portfolio able to handle something like that? Or do you want <clears throat> to get a second mortgage because you don't want to touch the first mortgage because that has a good interest rate because it was so low in the last couple of years. So maybe you get a second mortgage. Like there's all these options. Do you sell the asset, take the money in 1031 into something else? So all these options of what to do with people call it equity. I call it the ability to create debt on an existing asset. So that's the, the like later on questions. The first question, the most important question that happens before you determine how much you're going to take out, ask yourself, do you have a place to deploy the funds, to put that money to work where it's going to earn an interest rate or a return that's good enough to add the debt to the existing asset or to lose the asset if you sell or to do anything with that asset that's going to make it cost more because you don't have just whatever debt you're using on the asset that you're purchasing, but you're adding debt to the existing asset. Do you have something? And I don't mean an ethereal, I think I could probably find a property that gets an 8% return. I mean, you have a property in mind where you pretty certain your offer at your amount that makes sense to you will make sense to the seller and you would get it before you create the debt. Um, we're literally a couple of weeks away from when you can file taxes. So it's going to depend on how long it takes you to get your documents together to file your taxes. So it could, if there was enough room in the asset to do that, um, I did. I waited two years until I had rental income on my tax returns so that I could buy something uh, that I could house hack where the rent was also included into the income. So it made sense for me to wait a couple of years. If it makes sense for you to wait a month, month and a half, yes. But go back to that first question, the question that comes up before all of the, the, the how-to is the why. What are you going to do with the money? That's the most important question. Do you have something to put it to work on? If it's an RV, if it's a home renovation, if it's something that adds quality of life, but not quantity of money, no, don't do it. Gono, howdy. Tuesday evenings with Dion Talk, where all the cool kids get together. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. The people that hang out on Tuesdays and Lumberjack's lives and Zuber's lives, and when we can talk them into doing them, Millennial Mike's lives, are the people who will eventually have enough freedom to actually hang out together. <laughs> That's the goal. Nalair, howdy. Ray from Puyallup, see you all at Tacoma FI. I will see you there in about an hour. Rob, Dion, you said offhandedly that people were complaining about your Audible for Zuber's book. What was the main complaints? It was, <laughs> um, here's a life's lesson, if I can put this into one minute or less. <clears throat> when you attempt something, when you invest in real estate, when you start a YouTube channel, when you narrate an audiobook, when you change something about your appearance, strangers, people you haven't met yet, who enjoy the content, who learn from the content, who absorb the content, who see the effort you put into it, will reach out with a super chat and say, here's a dollar. Let me tell YouTube that you did amazing. They'll reach out with a comment to tell YouTube there is interaction on this video. They will send me an email saying, thank you. I appreciate what you're doing. Here's my current deal. Give me that, that dopamine hit of experiencing your deal, your offer that you've got going on. But the freaking people you know, your friends, your family will go, when did you lose all your hair? Why is your beard so white? Why is your shirt wrinkly in every video? Why can I hear clicks or background noise in your audiobook? It's the people you know who, great, I, I haven't surrounded myself with yes people, right? I love that part. But when it's something where you're just trying to help people, that's where the criticism will come from. And in this case, with the audiobook, people who have put no effort into anything in their entire life, who... Uh, 
worked in the loan industry, understood why 2008 happened, who is waiting for the crash to invest, uh, still friend, will tell me all of the problems with my audiobook. So it was kind of offhanded. And so far, it hasn't been anybody that I haven't met or, or I've only met through YouTube. It, it's been the people I went to combat with. <laughs> that was it. And it was, I think there was some clicking in the background. I recorded part of it in Florida where there were birds. And I was trying to find the time where it was quiet enough to record. Um, not enough to stop me in my tracks. Like I'm in the middle. I'm in the first third. So tomorrow my plan is actually to record more of the other Zuber book, the one rental at a time, his first one. Yes, my close friends and family are probably going to complain a bitch because that's what people do. But there's someone out there who would probably enjoy that book uh, that doesn't want to listen to the robot voice. And, and hopefully my voice is a little better than the robot voice. Thank you, Rob. That was, that was actually a good question because you gave me a chance to explain what the complaints were. Dylan, howdy. Another cert to climb up to a senior network engineer. Of course, just to make more money to buy real estate. Exactly. Um, making more money isn't a bad thing, but making more money and then putting that money to work it is key uh, instead of making more money so you can live the better lifestyle. There were several years, probably the last five years, where a lot of the people that worked at the school, so I had, I was a company president and we had campus managers at each campus. And, and there, so there were some people there that were in management roles, making decent money, buying $700,000 houses and sea dues and toys and all these kind of things. And I'm living in the unit of a fourplex that I own. And one of them actually asked me, she goes, how come you don't have a million dollar house? You totally have the money to have a million dollar house. And I said, you know, why I, have a million, I don't have a million dollar house because I have the money to buy a million dollar house. That's why I don't have a million dollar house. If I bought the house, I wouldn't have the money. And it never clicked. So 60 employees, a decade of working there. It was six and it grew to 60. Two in a decade ever invested in real estate. One of them retired this year, um, 42 days after I did. Not that Dan watches my channel or anything, but I like to rub that in. Because <laughs> he planned his retirement for like a year. Like he started investing 2018. Last year, he started timing uh, this many months, this many months, and I'm out of this date. And then randomly, a month and a half or so before, I was like, yeah, today's my last day. Poor guy. REI Stoners, why aren't you in Hawaii right now sipping on my tights? That's actually a really good question. Um, well, today I was, I booked and then canceled my Vegas trip because the people I'm meeting there told me their dates and then changed their mind on the dates. So I'm, I'm rebooking that. So I will be in Vegas poolside. It'll be 50 degrees in the middle of winter. Um, and everybody will think I'm crazy, but I'll be out there drinking by the pool. Um, I have not been to Hawaii because there's two criteria that I like when I travel. Um. And the first one doesn't happen with Hawaii. I like to go places where Americans are liked. And while Hawaii is a part of America, the Samoa Hawaii doesn't want to be, didn't want to be, uh, basically feels like a conquered uh, people. And they, uh, I just don't want to be called a Howley. I don't want to be looked down on. I don't want to be called an outsider. There's just a whole bunch of Hawaii I don't ever want to see. Like there are countries that don't like Americans I don't want to go to. There are parts of this country. There are parts of this country that like Americans that I can't go to because I'm the wrong race, right? So I'm, I'm really careful where I go to. Um, and Hawaii is one of them that I have no desire to go to. Um, sorry, Mark. <laughs> Financial firefighter. Um, I know you're having a good time there, but would not be my experience. All nighter hider. Euro dollars are US dollars, not euros. Okay. These euro dollars are credit-based U.S. dollars circulating outside the U.S. from foreign entity to foreign entity. See Jeff Snyder. Also, if you are a fan of Jack Reacher, um, the author Lee Child does a really good job of explaining currency when he's talking on a large scale on how much currency is outside the U.S., how much currency it would take to bankrupt the banking system. Um and it's presented in an uh, entertaining format with the, the Reacher background going on in the, in the you know, story going on in the background. Angel R. Howdy. Thank you for that. Lighter the rebel capitalist. Exactly. Gavin. Howdy. Question. 
What would you do if you own a property that is older, not disabled friendly, lots of stairs in and out, and tenant is starting to ask for accommodations and upgrades? Good question. Know your local rules and recommend uh, laws. Uh, probably speak to a lawyer and find out what is considered reasonable in your area. The definition of reasonable changes depending on where you're at. Um, make sure that it is safe, but do what is reasonable. That's the terminology that I would rely heavily on. Um, that's a great question because it's going to be very specific to your area. I know if you're running a business, there are certain things that you have to make accessible. But as far as a residence, I think, and this depends on your area, if your advertisement for the property says accessible and then you list out all of the, the accommodations that have been made, then that sets a standard you have to hold. But know what your local laws are, local code is, um, yeah, there, I don't think there's an exact answer to that without knowing where you live, the type of property. I've got I've got properties that were built. Um, oldest one's 1921. Most all of the rest, so one in 1921. The rest are all from 1980 or newer. I have one that has a ramp that was built after the tenant moved in. Um, yeah, I'd find out what's reasonable in your area. Uh, that's a good question. That's be a hard question to answer. But I'm going to put my email in the chat. Email me some details and let me see if I can find a better answer for you. All Night Hider is guilty of that. Dylan, completely agree. I woke up at 24, which was last year. My brain is rewired in a way. Financial freedom by 40 is the goal. And I totally see that as possible. I, I, I uh, maybe Dylan, you've seen this in some of my videos. I think the average person can reach financial freedom and make work completely optional in ten years or less, even if you're not starting from the best position. Most people don't start from the position where I was at. I've been laid off from a police department, was only making seventeen dollars an hour when I first started working at the truck driving school, and had found out about eighty nine thousand dollars in bad debt in my name I didn't know existed until the divorce. So single parent, three kids in that position, took eight years to make work optional. And then at 12 years, I retired because I had passed the 4X rule. Um, so if your position isn't that bad, like I've sat back and I've tried to think what else could have gone wrong. Uh, and all I was able to come up with would be if I had had a serious health concern at some point in the last 10 years, that might have made it harder. But if you if you take that out, I'm, I'm, I lost both my parents in the last decade. So like I went through like all of these weird things that can happen. Um that's not really true. I know where my parents are. I miss you, mom. I miss you, dad, but they're not around anymore. And if I can do it in that time plane, I think if you're 24 and you haven't created almost $100,000 in debt and you are hopefully making more than $17 an hour or have the ability to develop a career that makes more than that and you avoid life creep and maybe you're not a single parent with three kids, like take out all of these weird elements. I think by 40, uh, the challenge will be the financial freedom you reach by 34 focusing and staying working for the next six years, your financial freedom will become exponentially better. But at some point, I think between 34 and 40, might be even 30 and 40, depending on your position, you're going to struggle like I did to find a reason to keep working. Lauren, there are a few new quadplexes on the MLS on the east side, but they are currently alligators and not in the best area of town, east side. So yeah, it's probably the McKinley area that I always talk about, don't, not going near. Um, yep. I keep your eye out on the MLS. Lauren, the next three months. So all my, all my deals, except for one, I closed on one in May. The rest all closed between November and January, uh, November and February, uh, because during the winter, there's less competition. A lot of people are distracted right now by holidays. Um, they think people don't want to move in the winter. Less competition means it's the time to buy. Angel R, who's your favorite fiction author? Ooh, oh, that's a hard one. I don't think it's possible to nail down. Favorite fiction author when it okay when it comes to writing, Dean Koontz. He can put a paragraph into five words and make it make sense. Um, 
So Dean Koontz would be the favorite, my favorite fiction author. Uh, R.A. Salvatore, um, character development, but not writing style. Uh, yeah, so I've got a few. Least favorite, Stephen King. <laughs> Can't stand anything he's produced. Read or listened to all of it, because I like to hold conversations with people. But uh, worst, worst writing ever. Like Kiyosaki. <laughs> failed grammar a couple times doesn't need to be a good writer he's the best selling author that's a great question thank you angel um i read a lot of fiction like margaret weiss tracy hickman dragonlance forgotten realms r.a salvatore that kind of stuff but when it comes to i get a book and i'm super excited it's dean coons just the i don't know the level of detailed knowledge and his, his linguistic ability to write like he wrote the books odd thomas oddly like the sentence structure is odd that i've I've never encountered an author that can do anything like he does all night or hard okay comment dylan i agree rob i woke up at 35 then i got married and went back to sleep i wish i had taps queued up on my phone heinemann family Howdy. Thanks for making it on a Tuesday. Do you make it to a point to interact with your tenants on any sort of regular basis? Um, before I read the rest of that. No, because they're people. Have you met people? Um, or if rent gets paid and you don't hear anything from them, do you assume it's all good and leave them alone? Just, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I'd leave them alone. I have, I have one tenant, I think, I was trying to think of, you know, my least interactive tenant, and, it, and it's a Section 8 tenant who, in over a year, we've had two text messages. One of them was a question. Um, it had nothing to do with real estate or anything. And the other one was, did you see the letter from the housing authority saying that something had changed in the payment? And yes, I had. Um, no, no interaction with them. That's, that's everybody's, do you get your tenants a Christmas present? Uh-huh, I don't talk, talk to them. <laughs> that's, leave them alone. Uh, I live in a fourplex and the other three are rented out. Uh, one of the tenants pays in cash. So generally I either see him or my roommate see him once a month. <laughs> the tenant in the one is in the air force and has gone often. I, th I think I've seen him twice in two years. Tenants in the unit next to me. Um, I wave at once in a while, but I don't know. Even living here, everybody's like, oh, I don't know if I could live in a small multifamily. I'd have my, my tenants as my neighbors. <laughs> I've seen my tenants in another property more because that was the tenant that had to be educated on what is and isn't an emergency and what does and doesn't involve the landlord. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, maybe there are people who, you know, you get along with your tenants great and you get them a Christmas basket or you do something and you get them a gift card or something. Um, there's, there's like a spectrum from it's run like a business and you have a property manager and you never interact with the tenants to all the way over to where you're friendly. Right. So I'm, I'm friendly, but professional, I want it to seem as much as possible. Like there's a property management company. I mean, it's me, right. I'm the person, I'm the owner, but when we interact, it's because of something to do with the lease or something to do with the property. That's the level of our interacting. Um, I actually, I have a nephew who rents from me and I saw him at a wedding. He was at the wedding where I was the pirate doing the, the ceremony. I saw him there. And I don't think we've interacted in three years outside, outside of that at the wedding. And he's a tenant. Um, family is people too. Have you met people? Paula, howdy. Howdy to everyone. Thanks, James. And again, thank you, James, for that. I appreciate it. Derek, howdy. Closing on a property Monday. Congratulations. For cash after much debate and trying to finance another for our first Airbnb. S surpassed my Leo salary. Okay. Uh, so, so you're working in law enforcement. Surpassed your law enforcement salary and was going to call it quits and tell you your 4X video. So sorry if I extended it for you, but it's when it made the most sense to me. We can handle a recession. We can handle a rent reduction. We can handle, we're still growing enough to invest, to, to do things at the Forex rule. 
that's a rule I picked. I think if you watched the Forex video, I even said, this is what worked for me. This doesn't have to be what for what worked for you. Um, I could have retired in 2018. And then because of 2020 and 2021 being so crazy and rents going up so much, I would have been great. What if it went the other way, right? I could have possibly went back to work. But since I worked for the four more years and I hit the four X rule instead of the better than your, your freedom number, um, I'm trying to think of the sequence of events that would have to happen for me to go back to work. And I, I really can't come up with it without literally going black swan in something, you know, civilization changing. Um, so maybe, maybe you have the two X rule or the three X rule, um, but congratulations on your closing on your deal. That's awesome. James J. Hopefully this wasn't a question that came up when you did the super chat, because I would hate to have missed that. Um, and then my chat moved. Um, I love it when my chat moves. It means people are actually commenting. Thank you. There are a bunch of comments, which is great, because I was afraid there wasn't going to be enough. Um, there we go. James Shea, and you did put a question and you put it in a super chat and somehow I missed that you had a question because it's not connected. Sorry. Question for you. For those of us who are looking to submit only great offers that can make the numbers work for us in today's challenging market, how much of a percent discount of the asking price would you consider a realistic number that is not insulting the real estate agent and won't make them feel like we are just tire kickers and wasting their time? I spoke with a real estate agent and he seemed a bit taken aback by the idea of spamming offers. He doesn't seem realistic for his market. It would be 10 to 20% off asking to make the deal work. Thanks. That is a great question, James. Hopefully you're still here. I think the average duration is like 21 minutes or something. So hopefully you are. And why am I not getting live chats on here? Cause I'm trying to keep up with them. Um, uh, Make sure I don't miss any of these because I see we have some super chats to get to without moving the chat. And here we go. So James, how many days did they sit on the market and how many offers are you spamming? Right. The longer it sits on the market, the more likely I am to do a lower offer. Uh, you know, REI Stoners reached out recently and talked about, you know, how much is too low? 25% uh, off the asking price is the number that works for me. And I was like, okay, good. How many days on market? You could totally make that offer. Um, generally, as you know, three times the duration of what was normal, a 10 to 20% should be totally acceptable. If it's hundreds of days on the market, um, now, now you're, you're make a 10% offer, like 90% off. It doesn't matter once it's on that long. Get the conversation going. Do Use the lumberjack landlord strategy of asking, what are the three things that matter to the seller? Because it might not be price. What's what's keeping this on the market? Um, and transparency with your agent. I'm never worried about offending the sell, the listing agent, right? Um, they're actually, their job is, is to get the best offer they can to their seller. So Whatever offer you make, they're just going to compare it against the others. So it doesn't matter if, if you offered a dollar or asking price. To me, I don't care. My agent, the one that has to do the work, the one that has to put the DocuSign together, the one that has to send me the thing to send and send back and make sure all of the things done legally because they've got to protect themselves. That's who I want to make sure I'm having clear communication with, that they know, here's why I'm making a low offer. It, this is how long it sat on the market. Here's where the cash flow is even at this. And, and this is how I'm going to explain it to the seller. So tell your agent that here's the offer I want to make. But can you also ask this question of the listing agent? Here's our offer because it sat so long. We're, we're offering this because this is the number that makes sense to us because we're buying an investment and we need to get a return. But what matters to the seller? What else could there be that might make this offer more attractive? Um, so I don't know that there's a percentage that I would limit myself to because it's based on time on market. But make sure your agent knows, is aware and is okay. And if they're not, find another agent, right? Uh, home buyers who are going to take a bunch of time from an agent and go look at a bunch of properties, you're probably going to sign an exclusivity agreement. You're going to sign a thing saying, I'm only going to waste your time. So I'm only going to do a deal with you. But if you're an investor and you're having auto searches set up and that's the amount of work they're doing until it come time, comes time to make an offer. If you find one that doesn't want to make the offers, then you find another agent. But I wouldn't just go, oh, you won't make it. I'm out of here. I want to make the offer. They say no, because it's their job to suggest an offer that would get accepted explain your train of thought. Maybe they'll suggest something different. Maybe they'll just make the offer. Um, 
that's what I, I would do. And then I see we have a super chat here from Tom. Glad to be here. <laughs> Got it two times. There you go. And I'm going to make sure that, Tom, that there's no question here that I'm missing like I did with James. Phil Nealon, thanks. Hair <laughs> looks great today. It's, I took as much time to get my hair ready for my video as Matt the Lumberjack Landlord does. Exactly the same amount of time. Uh, San Francisco on the cheap. Thank you for that. And then let me look through and see if I can find. Make sure I'm not missing a question from you. And Phil, I'm looking forward to our call, which we have scheduled uh, or scheduling as soon as we um, get your problems in Siberia worked out. <laughs> appreciate that. I really appreciate the super chats. Those are awesome. I have about eight minutes left before I got to get ready to go to the Tacoma FI. So I'm going to try to get through as many of these questions as I can. Hopefully that James was, was an answer that helps. Foot ahead to freedom. Howdy. How much money you set aside for rent and CapEx every month? So it's a two, maybe three part answer. First, whenever I purchase a property, I make sure that it can stand alone as its own asset so that I get the yield that I'm looking for and consistently set aside 5% for vacancy, even though I've never had one, and 10% for repairs and maintenance. The idea is 15% of gross rents would be set aside. Would the property still cash flow and give me the return that I'm looking for? So when I purchase the property, I plan on that happening forever. But when I had seven or less units, I kept $10,000 in reserve. So that money was for CapEx and repairs and maintenance and vacancy. So when that was full, that 15% of gross rents didn't come to me to increase my lifestyle, to give me more toys to play with, to give me the nicer car, the trip, the whatever. That 15% goes to the investing fund. So the next investment happens faster. When I got more than seven units, I increased it to 30. So again, 15% of gross rents were set aside until I was at 30. Once I'm at 30, if I were spending that money, gross rents up to 15% of gross rents go in there. And it's like, what would that be? $30,400 or so um, would be set aside in there to fill it back up. But once it's at 30, that 15% goes to the investing fund. Then when I stopped working, I increased it to 50,000. So my reserves were 10, 30, now $50,000 that really doesn't get touched until I don't have the money to make a repair on a, on a building. And if I do have to do maintenance or a turnover or a flip or anything like that, flip of tenant, tenant flip over. That's not right. Tenant turnover. Then I'm going to have those expenses and then gross rents will go back. You know, 15% of gross rents would fill the account back. up. So currently that account's full. 15% of gross rents is just added to the income snowball for the next investment. Doesn't ever go to the lifestyle. So that if I had a bunch of expenses at a property and I have to take money and fix things and that account is low and then I have to pull money from cash flow to refill the account, that should not and doesn't impact cash flow that supports my lifestyle. Great question. Thank you. Gavin, 15% of gross rents. There you go. Zero to hero. Howdy. And thank you for that, Kevin. I have two single family and Gary, I had a bad experience with H&R Block last tax season. I was wondering if you could suggest someone to do my taxes on a local and federal way. Great question. Um, I don't have an answer. Well, I, I don't have a uh, referral for you. I try to reward the people that interact with me. My handyman, I give them references. If you're around here and you need a handyman, I'll connect you. Uh, my agents, I send them leads. I send people to my lenders, like all of the vendors, my my roofing guy who runs Clearview Exteriors in Yelm, Washington. I've had great experiences with him. Uh, great price, great business, great customer service, even when dealing with the tenants. Like everything was great. So I try to support them by sending people business. I'm not affiliate marketing or anything. I'm not getting rewarded from this. Just want to benefit the people so that they are more likely to interact with me positively in the future, right? It's done for selfish reasons, except for CPI. Just don't understand the business. That, that business model, he said, we don't need any more business. Don't send us anybody. My CPA currently is actually in Alaska. Um, so if I was starting, I would go to the bigger pockets forums. I would go to local REI meetups. I would ask other investors who the years and look and see if any of them has a, and I don't even know if it has to be local, but has a, our real estate focused tax professional for you to use, um, do price comparisons, look for reviews, hunt through, like you were looking for any kind of contractor. Um, so that's how I would do it. And I don't have a recommendation for you. Sorry. Instead of the logic, I don't buy. Scratchers, but sometimes get them as a gift. Me too. The disappointment far outweighs the fun. Yep. Um, there was a period of time where every now and then I would buy like $20 in 
and the big lottery ticket numbers, right? And it wasn't to win. It was the dopamine hit of daydreaming. What, what would you do if you won? You can't daydream about winning if you're not buying a ticket as well. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean, and it's funny, I really think lottery and gambling is a tax on the poor because when I was poor, I did a lot of it. And as soon as I had some money and I realized my money can make money, I'm not going to gamble with it. Big change. Amanda, howdy. When running the numbers on multiple houses every day, do you use the same percentage for property taxes and insurance? Or do you research each property from individually each time to get an estimate? So when I was first starting out, I would actually call and get quotes on properties until I got a feel for the average in my area. And then I pad it by about 20% um, for insurance. For taxes, it's actually kind of easy. Contact your local county tax assessor and, and or go to their website. Some of them just have it listed. Figure out the form formula that they use for uh, calculating taxes. And then remember, ignore what the taxes are on the MLS. Ignore what they are on the listing or what somebody's telling you the taxes are currently because there is a tax, a, a factual event at the sale that can impact taxes at renewal. And there are some places like California where it can happen once when you renew, but there are places like Texas and Washington where taxes renew every year and comps around you can greatly affect that. So make sure you're using as current as possible. So taxes, I use the uh, what percentage of property value based on the value of the sale would they use for the taxes to so do that every time. Um, Insurance, I've kind of got it rounded off now to where I know what a house, duplex, triplex, fourplex in my area um, would cost me. And then, I, like I said, I pad it by 20%. But those first few years, yes, it was a lot of I'm calling to get a quote on this property. Tell me what the options are. Tell me what the coverage is. Um, trying to think of anything else that is kind of standard when you're doing cost to acquire. I use the CDS rental calculator app. So I kind of have a suggestion if you if you go to do this. If you have a spouse or a partner you're trying to convince and you want something that looks really good, the Bigger Pockets rental calculators, which takes a pro membership to use after a certain number, um, gives you a better looking thing to present. But if you just want simple, what's my cash on cash return going to be? What's the amortization schedule look like? The CDS, because the YouTube content creator Chandler David Smith created an app. It's free. I think you give him your email to be on his mailer list or something, but you get to use the app for free. I use it all the time. Um, so what I call quick, down and dirty, um, but doesn't give you something pretty to show to somebody else if you need to. Um, and for me, that's been fine because I don't have the spouse or the partner to convince that a rental thing's going. Um, I am considering my first partnership on a rental purchase. And uh, if it goes through, I will be sharing that information. Ash, howdy. We have two more minutes. If you were starting from scratch now, how would you build your portfolio? So here's one of the things that I really struggle with, with how would you start now as an investor is a lot of people are looking at and, and talking to and interacting with the three amigos, the REI Avengers, like the, the investors that have a portfolio that have physical, mental, concrete proof that this works. So if you asked us what we would do, we'd rinse and repeat what we did. I would house hack. I would save a down payment. Um, I believe Zuber and Matt would recycle capital. I believe Millennial Mike would find a market like Gary. He would find, build a network. Like we would do what we've already done. It's really hard when you haven't done it. And, and what you don't have is our proof that financial freedom happens if we take this course. What you have, what most viewers have is these guys are sharing their stories and it worked for them in the time that they invested. But if you really watch, the reason so many of us have you know, congregated together is because none of us timed the market. None of us said, if you didn't start investing in 2011, you don't stand a chance. It was, it doesn't matter what's happening with prices. It doesn't matter what's happening with rates. The best time to buy is when you're ready, when you've saved the down payment, when you find the deal, you buy the property. It's not, should I wait two months? Should I wait for interest rates or, or the, whatever? So we would do exactly what we did. I think Matt, the lumberjack landlord, would be house hacking again. Um, I think Zuber would go one rental at a time. For me, save. Save means increase your income, decrease your expenses. They increase your income is the big part that a lot of people miss. Second, work on credit score. If you're starting over, there's probably been some life event that messed that up. So study the three or four year old Graham Stephan videos on how to fix your credit score because he's got some good ones. Then talk to a lender to find out what your options are. And your options based on whatever event made you start over might mean that lending is not your option. So you're going to have to go seller-based, financing, DSCR, asset-based, uh, or save and go cash. Like you're going to have to, you're not going to know what your options are. But so all the three of those things happen before you've 
picked an asset class, picked a market, talked to an agent, any of those things. That's a whole bunch of things that you could do to start that I do between deals still continue to increase income. Continue, well, I walked away from the job, but continue to decrease expenses, save and invest the difference. I've saved up the down payment for possibly this new partnership deal that I'm looking at would be my first partnership. But that's how I would do it. I, I wouldn't go out and go, what's different with the market today to make it a different way of investing than how I did it. Um, so if there are people that are watching this right now, that there are a lot of content creators who will say, in one year, you can have 20 units. In two years, you can have 100 units. I wouldn't do that. One rental at a time, house hack, probably two to four years between purchases in the beginning as I saved up the down payment and found the right deal. But within less than 10 years, work is completely optional. That's what I would do. And we have run out of time. So let me make sure I'm not missing anything here at the end. San Francisco on the cheap. I'm just making sure really quick because you sent the super chat, which I appreciate that there was no question with it because I hate how they make it so small and then you have to do your question outside of it. Okay, so I hope to see as many of you that live around Tacoma at the Tacoma FI meetup tonight. I will be there on time. And yes, thank you, All Nighter Hider. I appreciate it. If you can hit the like button on the way out, um, we are at about a two thirds ratio on likes. That's pretty impressive. I appreciate each one of those. Uh, I will be doing a video that comes out um, on Thursday. My goal, unless I'm too lazy, to tomorrow. But the video that comes out on Thursday should be, and I might come up with a different title because. This might work well with the people who watch my content, but I don't know that this will play well with the YouTube algorithm because I might get the wrong viewers. But that video is going to explain why I'm a hooker. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. <laughs>